I'm Kyle Malnati, your host of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. At Calibrate, we exist to help people create generational wealth through real estate. My personal mission is to encourage, empower, and educate you by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. Broadcasting from the Mile High City, thank you for tuning in to the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. Our esteemed guest today is from IPX 1031. We've got Tracy Wilson back on the podcast. You might remember if you're one of our podcast originals, the people who've been with us for over 100 episodes, over 150 episodes now, Tracy was episode 68, Investing 101, and it was a discussion about opportunity zones. That was over two years ago. And one of the things to know when we talk with Tracy, and I'll, I'll have him on here in just a second, when we talk with Tracy, we're going to be talking a lot about what might be happening with tax code changes and how it relates to people investing in real estate. Both Tracy and I are in Colorado, so a lot of the discussion we're going to have is going to be state-specific. We're also speaking in 2021, and so if you tune into this episode a year from now, everything we say may or may not be relevant. So Tracy, with that intro, let's let's talk about what could happen and how that might affect our real estate investing world. Thanks for coming on to our show today. Thank you for having me again. And uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen and we'll look at some PowerPoint slides as I talk. It's a great um, so point we... that if you're listening in on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, continue listening in, don't stop, but you may want to check us out on YouTube to see Tracy's slides to talk about proposed tax changes and uh, take it away, Tracy. Okay, so again, we're, we're gonna talk about what is imminent right now. Again, just like he said, uh, a year from now, maybe even six or seven or eight months from now, this, these uh, proposed tax changes that we're talking about could be radically different. Uh, so a little bit of my background, I am an exchange uh, specialist. I do tax deferred 1031 exchanges. Our company is Investment Property Exchange Services. We happen to be the largest qualified intermediary in the country. Last year, we did over 10.7 billion with a B dollars worth of 1031 exchanges. In Colorado, we did just a smidgen under 600 million uh, 1031s. We're a group of attorneys and CPAs, uh, including the banking staff and the exchange coordinators, everybody. We're about 300 employees. We're wholly owned by Fidelity, the largest title insurance company in the world one out of every three real estate transactions, whether they're residential or commercial, flow through our companies. We do all types of 1031 exchanges, forward exchanges, reverse exchanges, exchanges on things other than just real estate, like oil and gas or water rights or minerals or leases. We also do exchanges on what we call build to suit exchanges, you know, where you need to make improvements or do some construction to the replacement property. And of course, I think everybody knows personal property exchanges were eliminated from the tax code. So think of a business, maybe a 7-Eleven or maybe a liquor store. When they sell the business, there's actually part of it is real estate. And yes, we did the exchange on that. And then the other part was the assets of that business, the cars, the trucks, the equipment, uh, the coolers, the refrigerators in the liquor store. We used to be able to do exchanges on those items. We cannot do that anymore. So now to today, it's only exchanges involving real property. And I already just told you all this about being part of the Fidelity National Financial Portfolio of title insurance companies. And I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, I actually uh, handled the franchise for the states of Wyoming and Colorado and Utah. And we'll go briefly through what a 1031 is and then dive into the depths of the proposed tax changes. So section 1031 is just a very small, somewhat arcane section of the tax code that allows for what's called the non-recognition of gain. That's a fancy way of saying the following. If you have someone that's selling investment property, this is not your home, this is not your personal primary residence, they're selling investment property and they've got a $100,000 gain. Sometimes people don't realize that they're gonna get taxed on that gain, capital gains taxes, at anywhere from 30 to as much as 40%. Now, if you know anything about capital gains taxes, watch the news on TV, read a newspaper, capital gains taxes are only 15 or 20%. Where in the world am I getting this 30% number from, let alone a 40% number? Here's what it briefly consists of. 
Capital gains are indeed 15 or 20%, depending on your adjusted gross income and the amount of the gain. But then the next number, 25%, is for the unrecaptured depreciation that was taken on the property. Then the 3.8% capital gains tax is a net investment income tax done by the Affordable Care Act, or affectionately known as Obamacare. And then the last number, 4.63%, is the state of Colorado, it gets its pound of flesh when you should sell real estate. If you're in a high tax state like California, New York, New Jersey, uh, then the, I mean, California's highest marginal uh, tax bracket is 13.3%, compare that to the 4.63. Now you can see how capital gains can uh, approach that 40 some percent. So all those capital gains taxes there blend together and the effective rate is indeed 30-ish percent in most cases, and maybe as high as 40%. But if you do an exchange, then you can defer all those gains. Again, as a reminder, we're not talking about with 1031, the sale of your home. When you sell your home and you live there two out of five years, you don't have to pay taxes on the gain up to a maximum of 250 grand if you're single, or up to a maximum of 500,000 if you're married, finally on a joint tax return. And guess what? Sometimes people don't know, don't know this. You get to use your personal home exclusion over and over and over. It's no longer a one-time exclusion. You get to use it once every two years. Again, though, 1031s are not for the sale of your personal primary residence. They are instead only for investment property. So if you follow all the rules and the timelines and deadlines, which we're not going to go through today, and you buy another replacement property exchange into it, or properties, you can buy more than one, then this is what happens. The gain is actually rolled over into that new property. I love my graphics. Let's see that one more time. The gains roll over from the old into the new property, and you don't have to pay those capital gains taxes. They're deferred. For those of you that are listening in, t Tracy is get, is geeking out on his PowerPoint presentation skills. So, <laughs> so if, if you're not, if you're listening in on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you've got to tune into YouTube. Uh, Tracy, I would like to ask you one very specific 1031 exchange question because it yeah. happens all the time for me and my brokerage practice at Calibrate Real Estate, the brokerage. Clients will say, hey, Kyle, remind me again about, and believe it or not, about how many days that I have for the exchange to identify versus purchase. So that's sort of elementary, but that's question number one. And these are high level people that will continue to ask me those questions. And then question number two as a follow-up is, tell me again about the number of properties. And we almost always get into the rule of 200. So could you talk about the timeline real specifically, as well as the rule of 200 before we go into what might happen with the new presidency with tax code changes? Absolutely. So the exchange does not start when you go under contract or when you get an earnest money check, the exchange start at the closing of the sale, meaning that you have to, by law, have gotten a qualified intermediary involved to facilitate the exchange. Um, so the exchange starts at the closing of the sale, and there are two timelines, two deadlines that you have to be aware of. So the first one is from closing, you'll have 45 days moving forward to simply identify it does not mean you have to be under contract. You don't have to have earnest money. Although in today's robust real estate market, you probably will. You're just identifying. We give you a sort of a glorified sheet of paper that has blank lines on it. And you are filling out a description of the properties that you might maybe want to buy. And then the other timeline deadline that starts on the day you close on your sale is the 180 days uh, of the exchange period. That's 180 days to finish the exchange. In other words, you must purchase, close on the purchase of one or more of those properties that you identified in the first 45 days of the exchange. So the 45 day identification period and the 180 days exchange are running at the same time. They're running concurrently. Your other question that you get or encounter quite frequently is the number of properties that you can identify. There are three rules that you can take a look at. Rule number one is, you're limited to a maximum of three properties total. You can identify one or two or three maximum, that's it. If you say, well, I really would like to identify more than three properties, four, five, 15 properties. The IRS says, okay, we will let you. And then they turn on, apply rule number two, which is called the 200% rule. 
And it says the following, the grand total of everything that you identify, let's say that what you sold was a $300,000 condo that was the old or relinquished property. And you want to identify five properties, more than three, then they'll turn on this 200% rule and all five properties added up the aggregate dollar amount cannot be more than two times or 200% of the old property's sales price. Two times 300,000 is 600 grand. So 600,000 in my story now becomes your cap or your limit. As long as you identify more than three properties, five uh, in my example, as long as they all add up to be less than 600,000, then your exchange is still okay. What if you identify five properties and you're up and over 600,000? You're at, I don't know, 750 grand. The IRS says, oh, well, there's a third rule. We'll still let your exchange be okay if you actually close on the purchase of 95% of everything that you have identified. So is that all understandable, do you think, Kyle? Tracy, thank you for sharing that. And yes, it is. And, and the reason, real life example, without getting super specific on the actual person, I have conversations regularly right now with clients that own properties that are around three and a half million dollars. And mm -hmm. they have a lot of wealth in one property that they've done very well on over the past decade as the economy's recovered and as specifically the, the Denver real estate market has done very well. And what they're trying to do now is say, I've got all this equity, I've got all this gain that I want to defer, delay and not pay capital gains taxes on, and I wanna diversify. And so that's the idea of why they're looking for maybe three or more properties. So thanks for slowing that down and explaining that to us. It might be remedial to some, but it is, I believe, believe you, uh, me, it is one of those questions I get more often than not, actually. Not, not a problem. You know, the, the basics are what will determine the end of any good game. Yes. Uh, whether it's football, basketball, the Super Bowl, or, or even mundane taxes and 1031 exchanges in real estate. Well, thanks for going through that. Let's, uh, let's go into the next part of your presentation. You bet. Let's see if we can fast forward here. Uh, there was some more slides, and I'm sort of zooming along to get through them all. Here we are. I just want to let people see I get a lot of my information uh, out of the public domain. In a previous life, I was an investment banker. I worked for Merrill Lynch for a number of years, uh, worked uh, for Credit Suisse before that, got to do a lot of the work in the capital markets group and uh, uh, you know, economics and forecasting. And I used to be able to do a lot of my own research. I don't get paid to do that at IPX, I do exchanges. So a lot of my information merely comes from the public realm. And I just want people to be able to see all the various sources. By the way, if they want to email me, anybody that listens or watches, they can email me and request the slide deck and I'll be more than happy to send it out to them. All right, so let me discuss this template that's in front of us so that we can walk through it. Uh, go to the left-hand side, the uh, black column. There are six major uh, tax changes that we're gonna talk about. 1031s, individual tax rates, long-term capital gains, et cetera. The second column over the first green column is labeled Biden. That's what's being proposed by the Biden-Harris administration. Then the furthest column over to the right, labeled Trump, uh, is the current tax code, which was put into place, a large majority of it, in 2017 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, TCJA. So knowing that this is our template, let's move forward in the conversation. A little brief history about TCJA, signed by the president, uh, in December of 17, it reduced taxes for all taxpayers, 85% of them, across the board. Corporate income taxes were reduced from 35 down to 21% to help incentivize corporations to locate or relocate even in the U.S. Personal property exchanges were eliminated, I already said that, and the estate tax was reduced and the exemption increased. So here's what is the concept of the Biden-Harris administration. During the campaign, uh, two uh, Democrat primary candidates, Senator Saunders and Warren, wanted a wealth tax. They proposed a 2% tax on the wealth of anybody 50 million and above, or a 6% tax on the wealth of a billion dollars above. So you can see that this would have hit uber wealthy uh, people. Biden doesn't want to do that. Instead, he simply wants to raise taxes, sort of the old fashioned way, raising taxes on personal income, corporate taxes, et cetera. 
all in all, the Biden-Harris administration would raise taxes by about $4.3 trillion. But as recently as last week, Senator Warden is reintroducing legislation to bring back that wealth tax. We may see both ways of increasing taxes, uh, raising taxes across a variety of different items, and then a new wealth tax. Who knows? We'll see what happens in the ensuing months. A little bit of uh, politics, uh, not taking sides or anything, but that's essential to understand how this may all come to pass, how it's going to unfold. I think everybody knows that the Senate seats in Georgia, the runoffs on January the 5th, were, uh, went Democrat with Ossoff and Warnock taking the seats. This now makes the Senate 50-50. So the House is already Democrat. The Senate is now 50-50. And the Vice President of the United States, Harris, will cast the deciding votes in any tie situation. So essentially, this would make uh, the Senate, if they use what is called budget reconciliation, they would be able to pass the tax legislation that we're talking about and that they have talked about by using only a simple majority of 51 vote, votes. They're allowed to have three different uses of budget reconciliation. There are two schools of thought. This is a question I usually get at about this stage of the game, and that is, when could all these changes actually happen? There, one school of thought is that it'll take them a, a large chunk of this year to get the legislation put together, go through Congress, put it in place, and then it would take effect for 2022. Different school of thought is that these tax changes could be rammed through much quicker than a lot of people think, and they could be in place for 2021. And they're in fact, talk of the fact that some of them might even be retroactive for the entire year of 2021. I'm sort of in the former camp, but again, we just, you know, uh, at this stage, we don't know uh, what will happen. Again, more about this budget reconciliation. The Congress has allowed three uses of budget reconciliation. That's that simple vote of 51 to pass legislation on spending, revenue, and the federal debt. Well, they already used up budget reconciliation on spending. They just did it last week. They passed $1.9 trillion worth of coronavirus relief. So the only thing left then is the budget reconciliation uh, for revenue. And do I think that they will use it, the so-called nuclear option of budget reconciliation? I think they, they probably will. Um, okay, let's talk about these six major changes that we have listed on the template. First of all, let's talk about 1031 exchanges. There are real two different schools of thought about what will happen to 1031s. Why? Because during the campaign and even within the first month or so of office, uh, both of these uh, stories about 1031s have been talked about uh, within the Democrat Party. Um, they're either going to completely eliminate Section 1031 or they're merely going to limit 1031s. Really, well, what would that limitation look like? For people making $400,000 or more, they would no longer be able to use a 1031 exchange when they sell a piece of real estate. People earning $400,000 or less would continue to be able to use 1031. But here's something that's sort of weird. This $400,000 of earning is not defined. Is that a married couple filing joint tax return? If that's true, then that would make sense that a single tax filer of 200,000 if you make more than 200 grand, you would not be able to use 1031s. So this $400,000 threshold is not defined. What about taxpayers that are in an LLC or a partnership, sub S, corporations, trusts? Is that 400,000 uh, depends on last year's income? Is that how they're gonna measure it? Or the current year's income? We just don't know. So either they may completely eliminate 1031s or uh, limit it to those people earning 400,000 slash 200,000 or less. 1031s are an important part of the economy. In 2016, there was over $100 billion worth of 1031 exchanges done. Biden's plan for mobilizing American talent and heart to create a 21st century of caregiving and education workforce is a plan to spend brand new spending of $775 billion for care on elderly and child care. They're wanting to eliminate 1031s, which would generate maybe between nine to 14 billion in tax revenue to turn around and spend on 775 billions of, of new programs. 
uh, you know, does that make sense? One, well, that decision may have been made last November, that, that ship has sailed. 1031s uh, drive one in every five residential sales. 1031s drive one in every three commercial real estate deals, sales. And in fact, when you talk about deals 30 million and up, uh, that, that number becomes one in two or about 50% of all commercial deals are driven by an exchange. Some economists state that rent rolls would have to increase anywhere from eight to 13% to offset the effects of eliminating 1031. Commercial real estate property values may decline uh, eight to 12%. So talking about eliminating or, or just merely limiting 1031s has a significant economic impact. Uh, I'm moving ahead because in the interest of time, let's talk about the next big proposed tax change individual personal income tax rates. This affects you and I, uh, person to person individually. Uh, there are, again, two completely different schools of thought. One is, and they campaigned on, repealing all of the Trump, quote unquote, Trump tax cuts under TCJA. Again, as a reminder, 85% of Americans did get a tax cut. The standard deduction was doubled. It's now up to $24,000 for a married couple finally joined. If they repealed all of TCJA, then five of the seven marginal tax brackets would roll back up to their old levels. Uh, we don't know what would happen to the standard deduction. Just there are a lot of unknowns. The other uh, school of thought in raising individual income tax rates is the following. They have said that they would raise taxes on only those people earning $400,000 or more. Again, that $400,000 number, is, that threshold is not defined. Married, finally joint, single, we don't know. So that means at least for sure, even under that scenario of raising taxes only on those earning 400 and above would raise the top three marginal tax brackets. Bottom line for a Colorado state resident, when you look at state and federal taxes together, that means that the top marginal rate would be more than 44%. For people that are in high tax states like California or Oregon or Minnesota, New Jersey, their high marginal tax rates could be north of 60%. So what would be the economic impact? Uh, the Tax Foundation has estimated that it could reduce GDP growth, gross domestic product by about one and a half percent and result in total job losses, full-time equivalents of more than 500,000. Uh, why would that be true? Wealthier individuals who own businesses would reduce their hiring, pass along the increased costs of higher taxes, expand their businesses less, resulting in a contracting GDP, and of course, the resultant job losses. There are different schools of thought about what would happen if they raise taxes. And there are some people that think that, you know, we need to raise taxes to fund all these programs. You know, fine. Here's a question that's always been debated. Do the rich pay their fair share in this case, rich being, uh, I believe, 400,000 or more as defined by Biden-Harris. Let's take a look at this table for just a moment. Let's look at the top line, the income group. We have the bottom 50%, then the top 20 to 25%, 50%, uh, top five to 10, top two to five, top 1%, you get the idea. So using these categories, what's the share of income for each one of these broken out groups? There's the share of income for each one of the groups. Bottom line, what's the share of income taxes that each one of these groups pays? Well, okay, this debate of do the rich pay their fair share? If the rich are defined as 400,000 and above, 200,000 for a single, then if Biden raises taxes on those two people or those two groups, those groups earn 30% of all the income, but they pay 60% of all the income taxes. Is that fair? Again, that decision may have been made back on November the 3rd. So we've talked about exchanges, individual income tax rates. Let's dive into something, I hate to say this, that's gonna be a little complex, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and make it very understandable. Long-term capital gains. So here's the idea what Biden-Harris administration wants to do. The idea is to raise capital gains, which are taxed at a preferred rate right now, which is just 20%. They wanna raise it up to ordinary income rates. If they use today's ordinary income rates, that would be 
So in other words, they're raising capital gains from 20 up to 40%, but supposedly on only those people making a million dollars or more. Those people that are earning under a million dollars would still have a top marginal tax rate of 20%. So as a reminder, when I talk about capital gains in the previous concept picture here, we're talking about when you sell stocks or bonds or mutual funds here, not when you sell real estate. When you sell real estate, the capital gains are even higher. Why is that? When you sell capital gains, yes, there's a 15 or 20% capital gains tax, but there's also 25% on the unrecaptured depreciation, plus the Affordable Care Act, 3.8% plus the state of Colorado, 4.63%. So again, the total blended, the effective capital gains rate on selling investment real estate is always about that 30-ish percent rather than just 20% when you sell stocks or bonds or mutual funds. Okay, so this is what I think will happen under the Biden-Harris administration. I think capital gains is gonna turn into a four-tiered system. People earning zero to $80,000, Capital gains is today, right now, and would be under Biden-Harris, 0%. That sounds sort of good. You make less than 80 grand, you sell something, you don't have to pay capital gains taxes on it. Don't be so quick. Give you an example. Let's say you make 70 grand. You sell a piece of real estate and your uh, gain is uh, $40,000 on that piece of real estate. And you decide, hey, I'm under the 80,000. I don't have to do an exchange. Don't need to do that, fine. I'll just sell it. Guess what? You have to add the gain of 40 grand to your $70,000 of income. Now you're effectively making $110,000. The first 10 grand of the 40,000 gain would indeed be taxed at 0%. But the remaining $30,000 of that gain would be taxed at 15% capital gains plus the state of Colorado and plus the recapture of depreciation. So don't just assume that if you're 80,000 and below that you may you don't have to do an exchange. Give me a call. Bullet point number two, second tier. People earning from 80,000 up to 400 grand, capital gains is still at 15% plus 5% of the state. So I used a rounded number that represents an average of most states in the United States, that being 5%. And Colorado's pretty close, 4.63%. So 15 plus five, you're looking at an effective 20% capital gains rate. And oh, by the way, you would be able to do a 1031 exchange because you're underneath that $400,000 threshold. Bullet point number four, for those that are earning 400 grand up to a million dollars, now capital gains, again, I'm talking about selling stocks or bonds or not real estate, is effectively 30%. Why? Well, the capital gains would be 20% rather than 15 plus 5% state, et cetera. If you're selling real estate though, as we just talked a minute ago, real estate includes that recapture and you're really talking about a 30 to 35 to 40% capital gains rate. Bullet point number four, if you are a taxpayer earning a million dollars or more, capital gains when you sell stocks or bonds or whatever becomes more than 50%. Whoa, where's this 40% federal capital gains rate uh, come from? The following, that 20% federal capital gains turns magically into ordinary income. So it may be a lot more than 40%. If they raise personal income taxes more than the 39.6%, call it 40%, you could be looking at 40, 45%, whatever they make it. And if you're selling real estate, you don't get to use an exchange and your effective capital gains rate would be anywhere from 50 to 60%. Not to belabor the point, everything that I just told you, I put into a spreadsheet or a table format. We're not going to take the time to go through this. Again, if you want the slides, call me or shoot me an email. So capital gains are gonna change substantially, I believe, uh, by restricting 1031 so that anyone earning more than 400,000 or 200,000 if you're single, you won't be able to do an exchange. Your capital gains will zoom to that 50 or 60% level. Um, so again, as a reminder, or as a summary, I guess, under Biden-Harris, capital gains could approach 50% currently right now for selling real estate under Trump or the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, rather, it's 30%. All right, we've covered three items so far. I'm gonna zoom in on estate tax, then step up a basis in corporate income tax, 
Kyle, are we doing all right? Any questions or thoughts as we move on? I think we're doing just great. I think it's worth stating from a broker's perspective that obviously everybody's political persuasion is going to be individual. Oh, Everyone absolutely. desire, and there are some people that desire to pay more taxes than others. Uh, I've actually heard that, that people feel like it's part of their civic duty, if you will. And, and that's totally fine to have that perspective if that's your individual perspective. I think it's really important to understand though that this does erode away or strip away some equity that you have earned taking the risk in, um, in these situations. And it does limit your ability to reinvest when you pay capital gains, which is why so many people take advantage of the current 1031 exchange structures. So just a quick little reminder of why exchanges are important. Obviously, a lot of this is proposed. Some of it may or may not actually come to pass. But Tracy, I think if someone's interested in doing a 1031 exchange, learning more about this, having a one-on-one -on -one detailed discussion about their actual personal situation, how they get in touch with you both by email and by phone number. Um, well, my cell phone is 303-883-5846. Email is just simply my first and last name with a dot between them. It's tracy.wilson at ipx1031.com. Uh, to echo your sentiments, you're right. I, this is not political in any sort of the word. This is merely an examination of what's been talked about and what's being proposed. And everybody, information is power. The more information you have, the better decisions you can make. That said, in, in considering what the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of flooding the capital markets with money, the fact that interest rates are low, uh, compared to other asset classes, stocks or bonds or, or even gold or silver, anything like that, I think real estate is probably the best asset class to be in right now and for the foreseeable future, especially if you think there's any sort of component of inflation. So real estate is the way to go. Estate tax. Now, this may sound a little boring, but guess what? It is simply a tax on everything you own when you die. So it's sort of like the opposite of the wealth tax that Senator uh, Warren is trying to propose you know, taxing everything you own while you're still alive. This is a tax on everything that you own, your house, your cars, your stocks and bonds, your real estate, your baseball card collection, everything. When you die, if your estate, if you're single, is valued at $11 million or less, then you don't have to pay the estate tax. Yay. And the estate tax is 40%. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act under Trump kept it the same as it was under Obama. The estate tax exemption was raised under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from just 5 million up to 11 million. To be clear, if you die and you have an estate that's valued at more than $11 million, then whatever the value of the estate is above that $11 million threshold, that's what's gonna get taxed at the 40%. Here's what Biden-Harris is wanting to do. They want to drop the exemption level from 11 million down to just three and a half million. So now if you should pass away and the, your value of all your assets is more than three and a half million, it'll be subject to the estate tax. And oh, by the way, they want to raise the estate tax from 40 up to 45%. Okay, that's pretty much it for the estate tax. It wasn't too boring. They are talking about eliminating the step up in basis of all the things that we've talked about so far. I think this is perhaps one of the most important proposed changes. Again, these things are not set in stone. We just don't know what's going to occur. Step up and basis has been in the tax code pretty much since its inception circa 1916. Here's what it does. Uh, mom and dad have worked hard. They may own a fourplex that they uh, rent out, or maybe they have a small ranch or a farm or, or a, a business, a small business. When they die and the kids inherit the apartment building, they inherit the business or the ranch, they can decide right now under the current tax code, either sell it and they will pay no capital gains taxes. Why? Because the original purchase price, the adjusted cost basis in the property or the business steps up to fair market value in the date of mom or dad's death. That eliminates, it erases the capital gains. The kids turn around and sell the real estate and they don't have to pay those capital gains taxes because there are no more capital gains. They were eliminated, step up in basis. Or the kids could say, we want to hold on to the farm. We would like to hold on to the 
the, the business or keep renting out the, the fourplex. And later on, years down the road, when they do or if decide to sell the property, the kids will only pay the taxes, capital gains wise, for the amount of time that they owned it. Because again, the previous gains when mom and dad owned the property were wiped out on the date of their passing. What do the Biden-Harris administration propose? They want to change or repeal completely the step up in basis. Meaning now when mom and dad pass away and the kids get the fourplex or the farm or the ranch, they will have to pay the capital gains taxes whether they sell the property or the business or not. It is capital gains on unrealized gains, capital gains taxes on unrealized gains. This was one of the reasons that the step up in basis was put into the tax code to begin with. When people died and they passed on their farm or ranch or business, the kids, the heirs were usually forced to sell the property just to pay for the capital gains taxes. We're going back to the old, if this passes, I think it would be going back to the old bad ways, but we'll see what happens with the step up in basis. Last, we're talking about raising corporate income taxes. So. Think of you and me, individuals, we have our own personal income taxes. Will corporations also pay an income tax? And the corporate income tax prior to the TCJA was 35%, and under Trump and TCJA, they dropped it down to 21%. Biden-Harris wanted to raise it from 21 up to 28%. Let's take a little bit deeper dive on this. Here is just a random sampling of countries <clears throat> and their, their corporate income tax rates. You can see uh, right around the 25% level, the OECD average, that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's a gathering or a group of 40 some countries uh, so, you know, that are highly developed in terms of the capital markets. And I just took an example of different countries. You can see the United States on the far right hand side, just to note, our corporate tax was 35%, but when you include state and other taxes, it was just up and over 39%. So if you were a corporation, this is the point of the slide, where would you like to be headquartered? Would you like to be headquartered in the US or maybe in Ireland? Which one's got the lower corporate income tax rate? Well, Ireland, plus it's got great beer, so that's a natural choice. <laughs> and as uh, you're listening in, Ireland's at 12 and a half, United Kingdom, 21, South Korea, 24, Canada, 26, Mexico, 30, Germany, 30, Japan, 37, and then the United States at the largest at over 39%. So if you're listening in and not, not on YouTube watching this, it just goes to show you just how much of an incentive is taken away from having a corporation in the United States and maybe in another area that could be one of our neighbors. You bet. And all, you know, from 2012 to 2016, we experienced in the U.S. a lot of what were called inversions, corporations that were self-relocating to another country that had a lower corporate income tax rate. So when corporations don't want to headquarter themselves here, or they'd rather leave and go somewhere else, that reduces the number of jobs for American workers. It depresses wages, reduces the investment here in the United States. So what Trump proposed was dropping it from uh, 35 down to 15 percent for the United States. Congress wrestled with it during the TCJA legislation, and they finally settled on 20 percent. But at the 11th hour, the Democrats wrestled and said, OK, 21 percent. So for the past three and a half, three plus years, the corporate income tax rate in the United States has been 21 percent. Biden-Harris now want to raise it from 21 percent up to 28%. Don't forget state and local taxes brings it back up to a little over 32%. At that rate, with raising the corporate income tax rate, the United States would effectively now again have a higher corporate income tax than China or United Kingdom, Germany, Mexico, or Japan, for example, making us again somewhat less competitive in the market. So what I have on this slide is everything that I talked about without the template, just simple bullet points, repealing or limiting 1031s, repeal of the basis. I'm not going to re, uh, read all that to you. There is one more tax change that I think is dang important for us in real estate. 
all of us get to take on our income tax returns if we choose to itemize rather than taking the standard deduction. We get to itemize or take a tax benefit, so to speak, for the uh, money that we spend paying property taxes or state and local taxes. People that were in low tax states, so this is a map of the United States that's granulated down to the individual county level. People that are in the blue counties, low tax states, were effectively helping to subsidize people in high tax states that are in the pink or the red. That was before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, before the SALT state and local taxes cap. The cap helped limit the deductions to no more than $10,000. That meant that uh, low tax states were no longer subsidizing people living in a high tax state. Biden Harris would do away with the salt cap, and we would once again have people in low tax states helping subsidize people that are in higher uh, tax states for tax deductions. The question always hits me, or the people ask me, with this large tax increase, $4.3 trillion, that's about 1.3, 1.5% of GDP. What is it going to be used for? We, we've got a lot of federal debt. In fact, we've got $27 trillion of debt. Will any of this new tax money be helped to, to pay down or pay off the debt? The answer is no. It is all going towards $11 trillion of new spending programs. The Affordable Care Act, the public option, reducing the Medicare eligibility age, uh, Green New Deal of sorts, $1 trillion. Again, you can look at the slide and read more, more of that. Here's the bottom line question. Can we afford uh, to have more taxes when we already have 27 trillion in new debt plus another new $11 trillion in spending? And it is it even a bright idea to raise taxes in the middle of a pandemic recession? So that really is it. Again, we're just talking about what may happen. But again, information is power. And I think you're more well-informed and well-armed to make better decisions now. Well, and I think it's important to state, contact Tracy Wilson, that's T-R-A-C-E-Y dot Wilson at IPX1031.com. If you want slide notes, if you want direct questions, if you hear this six months from now and you're like, what did end up happening? All of those things are really important to share that we try to be evergreen with our content, but every now and again, as we have a change in presidency and as we have elections, these politics, they, they do affect our day-to-day -day life in the real estate world. Let's be very honest and accurate about that. And so contact Tracy and just also know the common disclaimer in the state of Colorado is that I'm not a CPA. Kyle Malnati is not a CPA, nor am I a tax attorney or just a um, you know standard attorney. So you need to constantly be seeking tax guidance you need to be seeking legal guidance and just make sure that you're making the best decisions by surrounding yourself with a very capable team around you. Right, Tracy? Absolutely. Nobody can ever predict the future with 100% accuracy or in any degree of accuracy. All you can do is the best decision you can make right now with the information that you've got at your immediate fingertips. And Tracy, last couple of minutes here of our show, I'd love to take you through an exercise where we do a couple of just rapid fire questions. If you want to uh, sure. stop the screen sharing so that we can oh, yeah. see Sorry. you a little <laughs> bit larger. No, that's okay. Um, and uh, so these are just a handful of questions that we ask all of our guests. For those that aren't familiar with the word calibrate, or maybe you're listening to this podcast for the first time, I named my brokerage company years ago, Calibrate Real Estate, because I love the fact that Calibrate's a verb. There's so many real estate brokerage companies and just companies in general that are named after a, a thing and noun. And I like action. I like verbs. And one of the things I really enjoy about the word Calibrate is it's used a lot in engineering and science. And two forms of the definition are to make adjustments using experimental results, taking external factors into account, or allowing comparison with other data. So that's one example of a definition. The other is to carefully assess, set, or adjust. And I just constantly like to ask people one-on-one, -on -one, Tracy, what you're doing to calibrate your life on a daily basis. And this is kind of a personal growth question. Sure. Um, so when, you, when you're talking about the immediate uh, scenario, here we are all living uh, in the pandemic. Colorado is a little bit more of a freer state in terms of movement and going out and dining than it is in California or New York. Um, nonetheless, you've really got to make a point, I think, and I do this, 
to go out and work out, you know, go for a walk, uh, go for a run. Um, so I, I do a lot of that in terms of my calibration. I've been very lucky. I've got all four of my children and their families here. So we do a lot of visiting even within the family. Um, calibrating when it comes to business, we do a lot of these Zoom presentations. We do a lot of phone uh, whenever we can, when everybody says, yeah, let's do lunch or something like that, we'll go out and do it. So we're trying to reach back to normal as much as possible. Um, I love that name, Calibrate. And sometimes I think you should even call it Recalibrate because there have been times in my life that I have completely recalibrated. Recal uh, I'll give you an example. Hopefully this won't bore anybody. When I was a kid and I was in junior high, I was, you know, you're looking at me now, you're gonna laugh at this. I was a real nerd. And I decided I'm gonna go out for sports. I went out for track and cross country and swimming and all that stuff. And I completely transformed myself and uh, did the same in college. You know, I got there on academic scholarship as well as uh, athletic scholarship. And, you know, you continually throughout your life, I think what I've done is make a conscious decision to recalibrate, reinvent yourself. I love that. That's, I completely agree. It's everything that we're about here as a brand, but then also just our personal journeys because every single one of us, and there's a lot of people out there say, you know, separate work from your personal life, but you're bringing your personal life into an office or onto uh, a digital platform every day. And every time you send an email, if you had some sort of thing going on at home that's bothering you, that's going to affect you as you're trying to complete your work. And I agree, physical fitness, very important. Also that personal growth journey of making sure that, you know, you've got a good group of people around you. We were just talking as we were ending your slideshow about having a great team around you as it relates to your real estate investing, making sure you've got good tax counsel, good 1031 exchange counsel. You've got great CPAs working for you, a great broker. You got a good family around you, good friends around you to make sure that when things feel like they're getting a little bit tense, you've got someone that can kind of ease the tension a little bit. Great answer, Tracy. Next question is the advice you wish you knew when you were 22. Comes from a song that I really like called Dear Younger Me, where the yeah. writer of the song is kind of writing a letter to themselves now that they've lived some life. So if you have someone working at IPX or someone that maybe one of your kids is friends with and maybe they're just getting their start in the real estate business, what advice would you give to someone in their early 20s? Uh, be willing to take risks, more risks than you would even think of. And then the other thing is persevere. You can't believe most of success is pure sweat and perseverance. Many times it's also that brilliant idea you know, doing something different or better, new product, new process, perhaps take that risk, but above all persevere. If you just keep trying, you just show up day after day. That's what sales is. Show up, pick up the phone, make the call. Perseverance. Great answer. Final question that we reserve for all of our guests. And this one evolved. It's actually one of the things that was kind of a beautiful outcome of doing a podcast in episode five. I interviewed my coach, Chris Oakley. Chris has since passed away over the past uh, year and a half. And it's one of the things, thank you for saying that. And, and a lot of people know Chris, just that was such a surprise. He was such a young guy with such a great upward arc. And it was really uh, pretty tragic, just an accident that happened. And um, Chris's answer to that question you just answered, the dear younger me was, he was in a group in his 20s. It was a mentoring group where one of the exercises was to read a book called The Principle of the Path by Andy Stanley. And in that book, Andy Stanley has his reader write their own obituary. Now, writing an obituary seems a little bit uh, maybe static or distanced because a lot of times that's done by a newspaper person that uh, may not even know the person who passed away. So I've sort of twisted that. And I like to say, let's think about your legacy. Let's think about someone that really cares about you and knows you and maybe is a family member that would deliver your eulogy, Tracy. What do you want to be known for? What would you hope your legacy is? And what would you hope someone would say if they were delivering a, a eulogy, hopefully, you know, years from now, decades from now? I don't know anybody that's on their deathbed that says, boy, I wish I had gone in the office more. I wish I had scored on that last deal more. It, it is always about personal relationships, friends, family. What I'd like to be known for is being a good dad and now a good grandfather. I've got grandkids, for goodness sake. A decent provider, done well, in some cases more than well, 
being able to help my kids when when needed. That's what I'd love to be known for. A good a good guy, a decent man, good businessman, but above all, a good dad. I love that. Great, great feedback. One of the things that's a joy for me as a podcast host is I get to have repeat guests and we may talk about something different. If you're not familiar with Tracy, Tracy was on episode 68, Investing 101, and that was a discussion about 1031 exchanges, but most specifically opportunity zones after that, uh, that recent tax code change, because there's a lot of people asking questions and that content's still relevant today. So go back yes. and check that out. We'll put it in the show notes here. And then today's discussion, like I said, it was, it was more of a time and place, very appropriate. What's going to happen. It's one of the things as a broker that I'm having a lot of questions thrown at me and to be real candid in the midst of a deal, I don't have a moment to kind of get my head above the tree line, as people would say, and really think about what is actually happening on Capitol Hill in Washington. And I just really appreciate you, Tracy, for diving into some things. Some of it may happen, some of it may not, but just your willingness to share, your willingness to inform. And again, if people want to reach out to Tracy, you can do it by email, tracy.wilson at ipx1031.com or by phone, 303-883-5846. For Tracy Wilson, my name is Kyle Malnati, your host of the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I want to say thank you to Danita Vigil, who helped us set this up. Danita and Tracy work together. And I also want to say thank you to Ann Russell, our podcast producer, for producing the show. Please rate, subscribe, share, send a text message with this link to someone you think needs to hear it. Obviously, give us feedback if you love the show we would certainly love a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We're over 50 five-star reviews now. And Tracy, thanks again for being on our show. As I love Thank to say, you. we will see you around the neighborhood. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.